Good evening, everyone. I'll just say before my prepared remarks, uh, in, in a world that's trying to decide how fearful to be, and we are a building that celebrates courage, I am particularly glad you're here. Good evening, I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and on behalf of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming this evening. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support from our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors, Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. Tonight's program is also supported in part through the Immigrant Support Program of the Government of Ireland. We're so glad to welcome the Consul General of Ireland, Leisha Moore, who is here with us tonight. Many thanks to her and to Vice Consul Shane Caffrey for their work and support of tonight's program. I'm also delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. J.P. McMahon has kindly agreed to sign copies of the Irish cookbook after tonight's program. Our bookstore will be selling copies if you are interested. I will say, though at first glance, it looked like they were selling quite briskly. I don't know if there are, those, uh, are, if there are any copies remaining, so hooray. <laughs> uh, we thank you in advance for silencing your electronic devices. We'd love it if they don't go off in the middle of the program. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening, and when the question and answer period starts, we will invite those of you who are with us to come up to either of the two microphones in the aisles to ask your questions. And please do ask a question, though I'm sure you have your own favorite recipes you could share. Uh, just ask the question tonight, thank you. <laughs> President Kennedy very much valued celebrated, acknowledged his Irish heritage. The Kennedy family's longstanding commitment to building a strong relationship between the United States and their ancestral homeland makes us especially pleased to host this evening's exploration of Irish cuisine. I'm now, del now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. J.P. McMahon is a chef, restaurateur, and author. He is culinary director of the Eat Galway Restaurant Group and runs the Anir Boutique Cookery School. Founding chair and director of the Galway Food Festival, JP is an ambassador for Irish food. He organizes an annual international chef symposium entitled Food on the Edge in Galway and writes a weekly column for the Irish Times. I'm also so pleased to introduce our moderator for this evening. Dr. Robert Morrow is director of the Irish Institute and the Global Leadership Institute at Boston College. Dr. Morrow, whose research focuses on ideology and conflict, spent the best part of a decade conducting research and lecturing in a number of different universities in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the, uh, the Kennedy Library and the, and the Irish government for supporting um, this excellent event. I'm very excited to have this conversation. Uh, the book arrived in the mail about two weeks ago. I was a little bit nervous. Um, a cookbook, I'm familiar with cookbooks, I use cookbooks, uh, but I didn't know how to talk about a cookbook. But I have to say, if you haven't taken a look at it yet, this is a cookbook that's very easy to discuss. And I look forward to getting into it with you. Thank you. But, um, but before we do, I'd just like to reflect a little bit on uh, JFK and his relationship with Irish food. Um, I did a little bit of research and I struggled to find something, but I found two things I think that are interesting. One, a bit more flip, I'll start with that. Um, in 1963, JFK traveled to Ireland and uh, he went to the famous tea party, the now famous tea party in Duggan'stown in New Ross, uh, where he was given a large glass of whiskey by a family member. Um, and he promptly gave this discreetly to his, his aide, Dave Powers, um, who drank it for him, <laughs> returned it to JFK, and, and JFK said, thank you very much. I couldn't lose face in front of my cousins. 
And I think this idea that Irish whiskey and, um, and, and its importance to Irish food is, is really deeply ingrained there. And we could talk a little bit about that um, as we go. But I think kind of more seriously, during the same trip, he spoke in the Irish Parliament. And he said that Ireland is no longer a country of hunger and famine. It is one of the best fed countries in the world. Ireland's destiny lies not as a peaceful Ireland, uh, not as a peaceful island in a sea of troubles, but as a maker and shaker of world peace. Um, and I think this idea that Ireland is reaching out um, in a way, there's a new kind of authority and, and power that it has and it wants to share with the world is something that we really get a chance to see, um, see in your book. So, but before we get to all of that, um, and before we get a chance to see it, I thought maybe we could start a little bit uh, with yourself. You know, you are a bit unconventional. We should have coordinated outfits. I could have worn my tricolor uh, no, shamrock yeah. as well. I'm I sorry I didn't. I found this today. Oh. <laughs> I know, in the shop around the corner, and I said, I might as well. I only, while, like my daughter says I have no sense of fashion. I wear black t-shirts and black jeans. <laughs> and uh, I, used to, I used to wear suits and that, and I, I used to buy them in charity shops and love wearing suits. Um, but then I, uh, yeah, I don't know, yeah, I'm, I, I'm uh, I just have one outfit, and so I don't have to think about it. Um, <laughs> I have to do this outfit and my chef outfit, and right. then I, I, I just alternate between those two. Well, the suit is kind of like a chef's outfit. For yeah, me, 100%. So it's I don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, I love wearing three-piece tweed. It's just uh, I don't get to. I don't get a chance. Maybe I should have done it tonight, and I, I do. I do. I just. I didn't. Uh, when I packed to come over, I literally put five t-shirts and. Uh, and one pair of jeans. I had to go buy a pair of jeans today as well because I just brought it, realized I brought one pair of jeans with me. Well, you brought the good weather with you, thank you. Listen, so. it, we have not seen this weather in Ireland yet. It's been raining for four and a half centuries. No, four and a half <laughs> years. It's been, it's been raining for like the last four weeks, uh, sorry, four months. And um, we've had a few storms. So uh, when I came today, I was like, it's like, God, is Boston always like this? I was like, wow. <laughs> I came in like a duffel coat. I came everything, just like waiting for the rain. And I was like sweating all day. So it's, uh, it's, it's great that the weather, um, you, you, you co I felt you coordinated that for no. me. I just landed. <laughs> I was like, wow, it turned the weather on. So you have no uh, formal training, per se, in, in cookery. You, you're an art historian, really. Yeah, um, I, I worked well from when I was about 15 um, as, a, as a chef, and I, I kind of alternated between being a chef and, and wanting to be an academic. These are my two poles. My father is an academic, um, and he never said to me, son, you better be an academic. He never said anything to me. It just kind of let us all, six of us, just do whatever we wanted. So I, when I finished school, um, I would cooked a little bit, and I said, I'm going to hang off going to college. And, get all that craziness out of my system that lives in your system between what 17 and 22 or 23 um, and I said I'm not going to waste college on that I'll just do that anyway and then I won't have to waste my fees so I went back to college in um, when I was 22 it was 2022 um, and I studied English and art history and I wanted to do art history and I kept cooking all the time and I loved reading and I loved reading cookbooks and um, in um, when I finished my degree, I started a MA and then transferred to a PhD in, in art history and I, I kept cooking. And then up to about 2008, I was teaching art history and we opened a restaurant. We just, it just happened um, in the sense of a building came available. My wife was in, in theater and she, we'd always wanted to possibly open a restaurant and there are not too many careers in art history if there's any art historians in the audience. <laughs> um, and um, it just happened there and I, I said, well, sure, I'll, I'll do this. and. And unfortunately, I, I, I went one way and the art history, it didn't really go another way. It just, they were very hard to gel together. And I kept, I only finished, I only stopped teaching on the diploma program in 2015. So it was only five years ago. I thought for 10 years, I used to drive down to Cork every Tuesday, teach uh, adult ed in, um, on uh, uh, European and American art history from Greek and Roman to to contemporary and um, I always find it very hard to, to come back and talk to the chefs and they'd be like what are you talking about <laughs> and then it was equally as hard to go down to the art historians and talk to them about a dish and they'd say what are you talking about and so it was very hard to push these two things together and, and the more I got involved in food and the more restaurants we opened and festivals we set up and that it, it became harder and harder to reconcile this um, this uh, elephant in, in, in the room and, and then also it's, um, uh, I, I suppose I had got in wanting one thing 
and then I wanted something very, very different in the sense that, I mean, I still, I, I, I don't know if you know, but I have started another PhD, um, and uh, I'm a glutton for wanting to, be, wanting to do a PhD for no reason of just to do it. I know it's a terrible disease, and um, I, the day I decided not to do it, not to finish it, I, and I had written the whole thing, I just wasn't going to submit, and so I, then I did an MA in English, I just said, you know what, I'll just go back and do an MA. And then I said, oh, you might as well do a PhD in drama, and then I decided to do, it, it's on food and drama. And that's ongoing. That's in year three. And sure, look, I'll hopefully I'll finish this one. And if I don't, I'll start another one. Um, <laughs> um, You're the most relaxed PhD student I've uh, ever met. So congratulations. Yeah. Well, it's very funny when they go in and they say career prospects. And I go, I don't need a career. You're grand. Um, <laughs> and um, I just, yeah, I just, I suppose for me, I, 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 I love um, the, the research element and the, the examining history. And a lot of that comes out in the book. And so when a lot of, of course, when I had said to people, I'm not going to finish, I'm not going to finish the PhD, like I, I didn't see it as, as, a, as, as something I lost because all of what I did along the way, the writing, and I wrote so many papers and traveled and looked at archives and all these different things I did. I mean, all of that comes out in the box. And so it was, it was a skill set I transferred as opposed to I just didn't, uh, I, I realized it wasn't going to be this career thing that I was going down, and um, uh, but I don't think I, I don't think anything was lost. So it's a good. Uh, um, what uh, it's, there's hope for for PhD students who don't finish their PhD. I'm going to remember this because most most students who come to me and ask me should I do a PhD, and I say, well, well have you taken a look at the market? But this is yeah. really interesting. This transferable skill set, and it comes across in the book. Um, there's quite a lot of writing in it. Most, I, I have to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever really read a cookbook until this book arrived. Um, I would look at the recipes, but uh, you know, why would you read the forward? Why would you read the introduction? But here I did, because of my role here. Um, and I found that it was quite fascinating and interesting. You spent a lot of time in the National Archives um, researching Irish cuisine and it, its history and where it, it's been. I mean, why was that important to you? Um, I suppose I just wanted to get a more complete picture than I, I feel I had received in, in, in the different cookbooks and how I grew up with, with, uh, with food in the 1980s, how my, my grandparents' attitudes to food. And I suppose I felt there was, um, there was something, something missing. And, and, and like, I don't know if, if it was precisely this point, but I remember, um, I mean, I, the, the research of the book took three and a half years. And, um, of course, I was running the restaurants and the symposiums and all that in between, um, in between this. But the, um, I suppose the, 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 the linchpin was, um, was uh, I was talking to this is a Scottish chef in, in Australia called Jock Sonfrillo. And, and Jock is very interested in, um, in Aboriginal um, Native Australian food. And he, it was, he was saying, we were talking about this, and like when you, when you encounter something completely undocumented, but at the same time it's there. And, and he had said, someone, someone had said to him, oh, well, they got by. And he goes, well, you don't just get by for 40,000 years. Like, that's something. And for me, there was this, uh, like people have been in Ireland for 10,000 years. Like, that's, that's, that's what we know. I mean, possibly 12, but definitely 10. And so for me, I just wanted to know, well, what did people eat 10,000 years ago? And how is that different from how they ate 5,000 years ago? And what, I suppose why, why we think about Irish food in, in a very narrow, prescriptive way, uh, which is pretty much just the last couple of hundred years, and what, what that means for, for, for the entire um, uh, food on the entire island. And I suppose I was interested in these um, these questions, and the more the more things I found that that kind of punctured that um, uh, stereotypical image, then I was um, I was uh, happy. I mean, sometimes I was I, I found things that that punctured it in, in not a good way, and so you, you don't you don't always know what you're going to find. And I also had to challenge my own understanding of Irish food because I came at it from a position. Of, uh, of the contemporary that we've had in here for 10 years and we've been investigating Irish food. Um, in an we don't use any, we use only two products um, that, are, that are not Irish. And one is sugar and the other is white flour. Uh, everything else, our, our constant mission is to, f is to run a restaurant just based solely on stuff that is grown in Ireland. Uh, and so I, I didn't want to, I kind of almost didn't want 
the, um, the, the rest of it. I didn't want the, our, 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 um, uh, the, inter, the international dimension of Irish food in terms of, say, even spices is good. I write a little section on spices uh, because we don't use any spices. And I was like, do I really want to go there? And it was amazing to see the kind of uh, the many, many different stories of Irish food um, across this period in time. And there isn't just one story. It really depends on where, what period in time you decide to look at. And then you're going to get a completely different answer to what the question of what is Irish food. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit because you spend a lot of time contemplating what is Irish as part of this, right? And you say that Irish food is it's neither static um, and, and now and, and nor will it be in the future, and it's multifarious. So, I mean, what do you mean by that? And what are some of the surprising things that, that you discovered when you were, when you were researching this history? I suppose, I mean, all nations or, or, or national cuisines are all, um, uh, I suppose, uh, there is a multiplicity to them all. And we cannot contain them by thinking of them in one way. Um, and, and this is, I suppose, when you think of any cuisine, you think of French or Italian or Spanish cuisine, but it's often when we look at them, we imagine them to be more whole than they actually are. So we think French cuisine is this lineage of X, Y, and Z, and it has this long tradition. But when you break it all down, it has just as long tradition as, as any other national cuisine. And that's probably a couple of hundred years when the nation was, was invented. Before that, it was regional um, differences. And I think, for me, the, the, the kind of multiplicity of, of, of Irish food was, um, makes, it, um, makes it interesting because it's, uh, it isn't a static thing. It's, it's constantly evolving and changing. And it will change again in, in, in 50 or 100 years, depending on the people, that, the people that work with the ingredients and where they have come from. And I think it's, it's interesting to, when you, when you come at the, the question from a historical perspective, the, like at, it's very difficult to find um, um, a point in time other than the last couple of hundred years where anyone said, I am Irish. It's really difficult. And, and J.P. Mallory does this in his, his Origins of the Irish book. And you go all the way the first 8,000 years of people being on this island, and no one ever once said, I'm an Irish person, and this is an Irish place. And so the, how that reflects on the food is, is interesting, because then it, there's just been food being eaten by people who are there, and what happens is more people arrive. And, and Ireland is built up of different waves of, of migration up to a point, and then it starts giving people to the world. And now it's built up mostly on, uh, on the, on the um, I suppose, we're really almost returning to the way different waves of migrations um, in terms of the Polish and the Brazilians and, and everyone else who comes to, uh, comes to, um, uh, comes, to comes to the island. But the, these successive waves change things and changed food culture and I, and I talk about that in the in the introduction whether it was the 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 first hunter gatherers or the first farmers or the bronze age celtic people or uh, the the monks that came there or the vikings or the anglo normans and it keeps on going and 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 and, and things change and change and change and then finally you get a position where you have a native population that are um, being um, subdu uh, uh, subjugated by a controlling power, and that's probably when the modern period will begin to understand Irish food, and and that colours our understanding of, well, one of the reasons why I grew up when my grandmother making soda bread, and I didn't grow up kind of feasting on wild game, was because I grew up as an Irish Catholic and not as a as a, as as one who um, uh, who had kind of come out of whether it was a, on the landed side of things or someone who was Protestant, and and, and that division does cut through food culture to a certain degree is that, that well, you could have two people, myself and my friend, who grew up in both the same age, and we grew up completely eating completely different things because she lived in the countryside and I lived in the city, and um, uh, she grew up as a Protestant and I grew up as a, as a Catholic, and they had two different outlooks, and so the interesting thing about, about game even was just like I didn't ever have game until I became a chef, and like pigeon and duck and all these things, and they were like, God, I just had them at home all the time, and I got sick of eating them. And I was like, wow. I was like, I got sick of eating Rice Krispies and, uh, <laughs> and drinking 7 Up, not like feasting on nettles and duck. Uh, but that's not to say these things weren't there. And that's the process of, of investigating and like 
and I say this in the introduction, like, like private history is not, is not public history. And you have to understand that I have a certain view and that has colored the way I think about food. But it's important to try and fold in uh, other people's views. And that's why I suppose I drew on the various different food writers of the, of the 20th century, um, Irish food writers, m predominantly most of them were female. Who, who were also trying to do the same thing. And they were probably also trying to answer the same question when people were going, well, there isn't really an Irish food, and what's the point in trying to um, uh, describe it or delineate it? But I think there is, and people have been constantly trying to do that. It's interesting. Um, you, um, you, you talk about the potato. The potato isn't necessarily the, the public history of Irish cuisine. It's maybe the public stereotype. But it, you go back um, to a German uh, ethnographer and cartographer, Johann Kohl, and, mm. and you quote him as saying, every day they feed on potatoes and nothing but potatoes. But then you also talk about the five foods that are Irish. You point out firstly that potatoes are not native. Um, and, you, and you talk about salmon, and you talk about trout, and you talk about oysters. I think most of us might identify those yeah. with Ireland. And then very interestingly, you talk about eels and, and seaweed. Yeah. So what did, specifically did you discover about these foods that you feel are Irish? Like, I suppose it's the, particularly with the, the, the fish and, and the oysters, the, I, for me, they, they, they should be seen as representative of, of being Irish because of the length of time we've eaten them on the island. And so I mentioned this in, in the book in saying that, like, rather than when we, when we eat salmon or when we eat eel, like, we, it's, we often don't get the time to think about the tradition of this food stuff um, while we're eating it. We're just hungry and we're eating it. Unless you go to an experiential restaurant and they inform you that you're eating this eel and they say, do you know they've been eating this eel in Ireland for 7,000 years? But for me, that colors the way I feel about the eel and it colors the way I feel about the salmon and oysters. And for me, particularly oysters and seaweed, which are, are two of my favorite foods because because of their wild aspect and also because I think of the way the, the terrain of Ireland is mirrored in them and when you like the, their kind of raggedy nature and the, 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 the ways in which you, you um, I suppose when, when you eat them, they're, they're almost like kind of like um, uh, onomatopoeic in terms of when you eat them, they, they, they taste like the landscape in that, in that way and you, 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 they, they give you a sense of, 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 uh, of where you are. So certainly, I, I, those those five, and also duck, wild duck is is uh, has been eaten in Ireland since since day one, and there were like we have to understand that we're like when people arrived, there were no cows and there were no pigs and there were no sheep, um, and uh, it paints a very different picture. And I think it's 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 for me it's interesting to try and imagine this period, which which lasted for three thousand years, and so it's it, it's lasted way longer than any of the other periods and how people survived on this diet and didn't even have wheat. And I think for me that it caused me to go, like, how can we learn from that? And how can we think about Irish food in relation to this period of time as opposed to the other period of time when the spot arrives and then everyone, everyone uh, there's a famine and uh, let people leave, people die, and then you get soda bread and then you get lamb stew and then you get beef and Guinness and all these things that, that, that emerge from that period and a lot of the food that comes out of that period, um, you, one could argue, isn't any more Irish than the, the salmon or the eel, um, but at the same time, it gets talked about a lot more. And that was one of the reasons when I wrote the introduction. Every time you write, you read an introduction in a history book, like they, 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 rel they regulate the prehistoric to the first page. And then the minute you get to the 19th, 20th century, then it becomes like this. And I wanted to invert that. And I said, you know, I'm going to give the 19th and 20th century the smallest amount of time in the introduction because uh, it doesn't need any more. And I think people need to understand um, um, the, 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 previous, um, the previous period and, and, and why take 200 years and fill out an introduction with just those 200 years and just regulate the first 8,000 to one page because we don't have... Um, uh, documented writings, and I think it's it's uh, it's important, and it's also important not to say like I'm not looking for any originary Irish food. I mean that's it, it's very important to say that that's not the purpose of the book, and I'm not trying to say the salmon is more Irish than the lamb or that. I'm just trying to say that we need to see see it in a much broader broader light, um, 
and, um, and, and our own contemporary understanding will, 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 um, will, will in, inflect that, in, inflect how we see it. We still eat salmon, we still eat eel, and of, of course eel is probably very unappreciated and most of it, expo most of it is exported. Um, but I do think that it's probably something that I'd like to see more people uh, identifying with Irish with smoked eel, because we all know smoked salmon, but Loch you get wonderful smoked eel in Loch Ney. And uh, again, most of it is exported. So it's just, again, the book is to point to various different parts of Ireland and the food of Ireland where people can enjoy and go, I didn't know this was part of Irish food culture. It's interesting. I mean, you talk about, <clears throat> you even talk about that process in the book. You say, look, this is not a reconstructive history. This is a, this is a historical account that I'm going to use to do something mm. in the future. So you're really always looking towards the future of Irish food. I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the most exciting things that you discuss in the book. You, 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 you focus on foraging. You focus on aquaculture. You focus on sustainability. Um, how is that? important to Irish cuisine and then you know Ireland's place in the world stage through these mm -hmm. mechanisms like I think the like the wild food was one of the most important aspects of the book because I suppose I felt all the different books that have been written about Irish food since the 1850s actually you can go you can find cookery books on on Irish food it's probably in under Ireland and Britain and that but there are cookery books um, and uh, like I found a really interesting shellfish one, I think, from 1852. And there was, um, I was completely sorry, but there was an oyster and nutmeg recipe. There were so many recipes that didn't end up in the book that I was like, God, I could have just filled. I mean, there was, an, there was 900 recipes at the cut, and we could only get 500 in. And I could have gotten like 2,000, I'm sure. Um, there was like, listen, this is like a commercial project. You and your <laughs> leg, you are just going to keep on collecting things infinitely. And then, I'll, I, then when I'm 90, I'll come back and go, I'm finished. Um, but, um, but the wild aspect was really important. The seaweed was really important. The, um, and, the, and the game was really important. And I suppose those three things for me, and they all go around, go around the wild, are, are something that we have just refound in Ireland in, uh, in the last 15 years or so. It has always been there. People have always been hunting. People have been foraging. One of, the, uh, one of my favorite foraging books was published the year I was born in 1978. And so, that, so it's not like a new phenomenon. Um, and I, but I, I had felt that this, it, wasn't, it wasn't woven into the Irish food experience in any complete way. There were references like Doreen Allen has written amazing books on Irish food. Doreen has mentioned wild food occasionally. But I really wanted an index of what we had done in 10 years in an year and to try and give that to the world and say, this is what we've done. And I'd, I'd wanted that uh, section illustrated and this, oh, well, I'd loved, would have loved to illustrate the seaweed section, but unfortunately, the space, um, it, it, if we did that, then, then we would have to lose, lose more recipes. And I was conscious of the fact that because it was kind of like showcasing Irish food to an international audience, that more recipes were better and possibly at another date I would, um, uh, we would um, uh, illustrate the, the seaweeds and that. But they were important and, and, and you mentioned sustainability and like wild, our relationship to the wild is, is, is very important and particularly around issues of sustainability and it, it teaches us, and I don't mean this in any romantic way, um, like the wild is also a very dangerous place and it will kill you. But um, I, uh, I'm like kind of a pragmatist. I do think it can teach you how, um, how to live seasonally or even how to understand stuff seasonally. I'm not saying never go into the supermarket again and live in the woods. I'm saying that maybe go into the woods uh, like twice a month and see what's there. And do read a book before you eat it uh, because you've got to come back out of the woods. But, um, but it, that relationship, and that's only something I learned in the last 15 years. I didn't grow up like um, uh, with this, this wild culture um, around me. I remember talking to a German forager and he was, we were, like, he was looking at me as if like the two of us were the same and I was thinking, oh my God, I'm like not the same as you. In fact, not in a bad way, but he was like, I remember drinking nettle tea in the Rhine Valley. And I was like, I remember having like flat seven up because uh, <laughs> uh, I was sick, uh, but we never got the nettle. And, but we have were some really good chats and we would go and forage and he would like literally the mind of information on the nutritional side of, of, um, of stuff. 
and I would be saying, oh, this is what we cook with this, and this is how we cook with that. And so it was amazing how we could teach each other, even though we were coming out from completely two different ways. But I love the way a product will come up, like, say, wild garlic, um, which you guys call, call ramps, and like the leaf will come up, then the flower will come up, and then the flower will fall off, and then you're left with the bud. And you have like two to four weeks from each period, and then it's gone. And what you do with that, you need to preserve it if you want to have it. And that teaches you about the seasonality of, of, uh, of stuff. And, and it kind of makes you a little bit more humbled towards like, well, maybe I don't need like whatever I think I need all of the time. Because the, the reason why we're, we, we're, we have environmental difficulty is because we have a system that um, allows us to have whatever we want all of the time. And whether that's salt and sugar or oil or whether it's tomatoes or avocados, or potatoes, it doesn't matter what it is. And it, 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 it has consequences to the ways in which we, we have to live. And it also has consequences to the, 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 the farmers and uh, the ways in which we, we, we have this kind of like on-demand on culture where you go into the supermarket and you go, I sh these should be in the, the supermarket. And I remember uh, like uh, years ago, we ran a pub um, trying to apply what we did in the near to the pub, and it was like, of course, the BLT. And I was like, well, tomatoes are our season, so they're not in the, not in the, not on there. And then, of course, the customers were like, where's the tomatoes? And they're like, we'll go down to the shop and buy them and put them in them if you're not going to put them in. And I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to put them in. And so, some things you can win, and some things you cannot win. Uh, you can win it in a Michelin star restaurant, but not in a pub. Um, and so we, we, we have flexibility around seasonality in our, in our, our two other restaurants. But at the same time, it is the, the driving force because I think if you can let that seep into your life a little bit, then I think you, you, have, a better, you have a better understanding of, uh, of how, how the planet thinks, you know? So one place where uh, sustainability and the international is face of Irish food meat is around fish. Yes. Um, and you said that, uh, you said elsewhere that uh, when foreign chefs visit you, they ask you two things. One, is Ireland independent? Uh, I can tell you that uh, that annoys yeah. most Irish people. My wife is from Dublin. Um, this is the number one complaint she has about the way people view Ireland. The second is, and the first time I went to Ireland, I had the same question, do you have fish? Yeah. And it's kind of ironic. It's an island, as you point out many times. You know, so. Can you talk about how your relationship with the sea and your relationship with seafood? You, in this book, there's a whole section on shellfish. There's a separate section for saltwater fish and freshwater fish. So there's a lot going on here with um, seafood. And then, of course, things like uh, sea lettuce, seaweed that, that you're using. I mean, why are you so drawn to that? Um, and, and, and what excites you about the possibilities around seafood and sustainability? Um. Yeah, we, we have a very difficult relationship with the sea, and like there's, there's, it's multifaceted, and, and um, some of it goes back to when we became farmers for 7,000 years ago, and, and this happened in every culture, that the, the backs were turned to the sea to a certain degree because the sea is, is, uh, is less, um, you're, it is less dependable if you're a farmer. You can plant your stuff. Of course, you can have cro crop failure and that, but at the same time, um, it was seen as, as, as something that could facilitate farming as opposed to uh, the two of them working together. And from that point up to the point where the, um, Ireland was uh, colonized, the, we did not have access to the seas in any kind of meaningful way in the way that, say, the Dutch had or, um, or, the, or the Spanish had. So I think this colored our relationship to, to, to fish. Also. Um, shellfish was seen as, a, as something that, uh, uh, that only the poor would eat, and that's the same in, in, in Boston before the pre uh, pre twentieth century. I mean, if you eat mussels and lobsters, it was just like the, the, the if you had to go and get them yourself. And it wasn't really until it's the twentieth century where this is appropriated by um, by I suppose by a wealthier class and seen as uh, as something that it, that they want to eat. But and seaweed is the same thing, like living off cockles and mussels and seaweed and, and and literally living hand, uh, hand to mouth. Um, and also, I think the other aspect is, is the ways in which fish was used as, uh, as a sign of, of fasting in the 20th century, as a sign of kind of penury, is that you're not, you're not going to enjoy fish. And it really wasn't until I went to, went to Spain in my um, early 20s and read the way the Spanish 
cook fish and treat fish, and most of it was Irish anyway, um, uh, that I really went, wow, we're just not using this, and we're just such an underutilized um, thing. And even still to this day, most of the mussels and most of the lobsters that I was just talking to someone in this, uh, someone to, uh, today about it, um, that most of the lobsters are still exported because the French value them more than we do. And while the restaurants will buy lobsters, like on any given day, I can't imagine too many people wandering around looking for, looking for lobsters. And then the fishermen um, have, um, have a very strange relationship with it as well. They see it as a commodity. And that's the way some of the farmers see the cattle as well. And I think it's the new generation of farmers and fishermen that would see their product as food, and then they start to market it as food. And these are some of the, the farmers and fishermen that I, that I work with. I remember one of the lobster guys, we were filming out in the Iron Islands, and we were doing a barbecue, and we were doing a barbecue of fish. And it's like, sure, what would you be doing barbecuing fish? Uh, sure, isn't this a meat you barbecue? And uh, I was like, well, it's for, for the telly, so we better just pretend. <laughs> and so we're doing the telly, we're doing the shellfish and uh, the fish and seaweed, and they're always going, sure, what's that anyway? And it's like, it's seaweed, and they're going, all oh, right, so. And then the guy arrives with the lobsters, and I was like, it's like, oh, um, uh, do, you want, uh, do you want some barbecued lobster? And he went, I fucking hate lobster. <laughs> and uh, he goes, I'd rather have a burger. And he was, I was like, oh, you're a fifth generation lobster fisherman. And I was like, wow. I said, that, that for me just encapsulates 10,000 years of our relationship to the sea. Um, and, but I, I, I just, I really love the, I suppose, the purity of it. And when, when you use fish and, uh, and seaweed, and when you cook with them, like, ironically, your food ends up looking Japanese. And the irony, I've, I've yet to get to Japan, and I mean, I love, I love Japan in terms of its food culture. And so many people, and particularly America, I mean, we have like maybe 60, 70% of our guests in an era are American, and they all, it was started to come in and say, God, your, your food is so Japanese. And I was like, God, I haven't been yet. And I would start to look up and say, it reminds me of this Kayazaki tasting menu, and you have your little bit of fish and your seaweed. And, and, and ironically, when sometimes when we do contemporary Irish food, it ends up looking very unlike Irish food. And then people go, well, that's not really Irish food. And you're going, well, it's fish and shellfish and, and seaweed. And they go, well, that doesn't make it Irish, though. Um, and like, it, it, it is a difficult, it's, a, it's, it's not an easy question to answer because we're, we're still drawn to that idea that food in Ireland is, is comforting, it's, it's large, it's, uh, it's for darker, grayer weather, and we want, to, we want to sit down with a big bowl of stew or something hearty. And when you give someone something very elegant and um, simple and refined, even if it's not in the context of a, of a fine dining restaurant, uh, and they eat it and the taste is quite pure, they don't associate that taste with Irishness. Uh, they associate it with Asian food. Um, and, and that's, for me, it's been an interesting process, particularly when you leave out spices and you leave out the pepper and you leave out everything else and you season something with salt and a little bit of vinegar, you leave out lemons as well, then you, you end up getting this taste that for me is, is one aspect of the, of the contemporary uh, position of Irish food and, and that's of course for me the element that I'm most interested in. Um, and it was something, again, I struggled with this, with this idea of Irish food and, and writing about the past because on the one hand, I have this, I, this idea of Irish food as very terroir driven, unspiced, not, not subject to external influence. And then the whole history is coming up like a train going, you're wrong. Um, and my, my, my friend is a food historian, Regina Sexton, went, do you know your idea of contemporary Irish food is so ahistorical and wrong that, and I was like, well, it's mine, and you're not taking it away from me. <laughs> and that's why when I, when I, when I say, and I have a disclaimer at the start of the book, that this is, not a, this is not a history of Irish food, that it was important for me to say that because I understand like the food historians will come after me, you know, and um, I, I know how the academic world works, and uh, it was nice to not have to footnote anything and to, uh, to be imaginary and to say, well, look, I don't have evidence that hunter-gatherers sat around a fire and cooked mussels and ate them with dillisk. I know they cooked mussels. There is evidence for like burnt mussels in, in fireplaces. But at the same time, uh, there's, there isn't uh, any evidence not to say that. And so the, 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 the absence of that evidence doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means that we can't say for certain. And I think sometimes when you get wrapped around with certainties, particularly with prehistoric, I think it limits our our view of the present and how we can how we can re-engage with it imaginatively. I think we feel we can learn a lot from looking at this at this period in in, in Irish in um, 
in, uh, in Irish history. And it's probably the period that I, I, I think is, is most interesting. And it's probably one that draws most people to Ireland. When you think of Newgrange and you think of all these different places, they're all in that kind of Mesolithic, Neolithic period where people are, um, are want to see how people lived a, a long time ago. No, it, it, it's interesting, and, and that um, imaginative approach definitely comes across um, in the recipes. And one reason I found this book amusing was that you mixed incredibly complicated, or to, to my mind, um, complicated dishes, uh, asparagus wrapped in, in seaweed, for instance, or deep fried squid with garlic, um, you know, from the Irish, from thinking about Irish food, that's not what comes to mind, with things that are, you know, indebitably Irish crisp sandwich, yeah. you know, an egg salad sandwich. Maybe we should explain what a crisp sandwich is because when I first encountered it, it made absolutely no sense. But as I started to think about it, it, it started to make more sense to me. So, oh, like I mean, it's it, it's it's a work of art in terms of you take something really soft, which is the bread, and then you take something really crunchy, and then you take butter and you put them in between it, and you eat it, and it's like. Um, it's a very refined thing. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, it's something you eat every day, and it's something Aer Lingus now sells in a little box, and you can make it like it's a genius. It's like it's like theatre in a, in, a, in a box. You can make your own crisp sandwich, and um, and like for me, the, the, it's, it was important to to inject a little bit of humour into the book, and and I think we can get very serious as well when we want to define Irish food, and you end up leaving out all these things and. Um, I think, I remember suggesting, some things I would suggest to fight on, and they were like, oh, that's amazing. And some things I would suggest, they were like, no way. Uh, because, like, of course, the crisp sandwich made it in, but like the, the, the puffin didn't make it in, you know? And uh, I don't know if anyone knows that we used to eat puffin on, on Ireland, and we ate them for a long time, and the monks lived off in the Mount Skellig, but we don't eat them anymore. And, and, it, and it's, it's harder to, um, to get a, a puffin recipe into, into a book when they're, when they're protected. <laughs> And I remember putting up on Twitter going, can anyone get me a puffin? And the Irish Wildlife Trust got back to me and went, no, uh, they're protected. <laughs> and I was like, I just want one. Um, and because they eat them in Iceland, I have a friend who's an Icelandic chef. And they, literally, it's, it's an anomaly of history. They're just a cute pigeon. We eat pigeons all the time, wood pigeon, and we have no problem because they're not cute. And they have their maritime friends who live on the rocks, and they don't get eaten. So there were things like that that, um, that I couldn't put in. Uh, that, again, well, I did put in a little mammal section to, to signify. But I suppose for me, there was the humor of, of, um, of someone like either making a crisp sandwich or roasting a puffin. Uh, and I wanted that, that, that kind of element to, 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 to be among the wild duck recipes and venison legs and then have an egg salad sandwich because I grew up eating these things. And it, there's some, something of, like almost kind of iconographic about this, these egg sandwiches they served at all the funerals. It was almost like, I don't know who made all the money at the funerals, but someone making egg salad sandwiches. And when you, when you look at different recipes, what should be in them and what shouldn't be in them. And like if you put spring onions in, you're getting very, very fancy. And like, I just loved all of that. And, and that, that's, that is a food culture and it represents the ways in which um, we, we grew up. And I think, I think the, the way I understand food now gives me greater appreciation of eating a crisp sandwich and thinking this is nothing. Because every time you eat, you, it's a cultural activity. And, and no matter what you eat, and, and I think we have to get cut across high and low value. And, and to read to see it kind of on a, on a, a kind of a horizontal spectrum and say, and we were talking about this beforehand, that having a crisp sandwich or egg salad sandwich and then having, an, having some scrambled eggs with chorizo. And of course, you could say, well, chorizo's got nothing to do with Ireland. And I would say, well, no, it has, because Figo Ferguson makes it in Ireland. And his mother was very influenced by Spain. And she makes scooby and cheese. And she was inspired by cheesemakers in Spain, who were in turn inspired by Irish cheesemakers before, hundreds of years before. And so we never know where things are coming from. And where they're and where they're gone, and and even in relation to cheese, and the Irish farmhouse cheese movement is amazing, and it's been going since the late 70s. But it really was reignited then, and we had a great tradition of cheese making when we had the monks in the monasteries, and, and unfortunately, all that went with, um, with I suppose warring with the warring with the English, and um, and that's like that's just one of those kind of historical things, and it's not that you want to blame. Um, saying, well, it would have been different. I mean, it could have been different anywhere, but I, I suppose I'm just trying to trace uh, um, a pattern out. And then hopefully the, that what we, the way I describe things will give people um, hope for, for the future and they will be able to enjoy their wild duck and 
orange and juniper on their crisp sandwich and say, oh, both of these things are, are equally as, uh, as, uh, as good examples of, uh, of Irish food. I'm sure you can make a Michelin star crisp sandwich. I haven't tried it yet, but <laughs> I'd say you could. I mean, you make the bread really small, and you toast them, you put in the crisps, and get a tweezers to put them on, and put it on a very large plate, and charge 50 euro. Um, and uh, I'm sure, I'm sure it can be done. <laughs> the, um, the trays of egg salad and tikka chicken sandwiches are dangerous. I mean, you oh, know, you're not watching what you're doing, you could eat. You just eat, like eat, you have eat, a loaf of bread yeah. gone. Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't even, yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> but you, I mean, you're trying to do something with this book, right? It's a, it's a in, in a lot of ways, and, and you say this in, in other forms that, um, you, in which you're a leader, this is a call to action, right? Um, and uh, I think in one of your talks I saw on YouTube, you pointed out that there are something like 70 million photos a day on Instagram. Oh yeah, Instagram, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. So it's, it's probably more now, because that was, God, that would only been five years ago, so. It's, a, I'm not a great Instagram follower, but I mean, it is kind of a format that, um, that, that shows the beauty of the, or, or not, depending, I guess, on what you're trying to say. This book shows the beauty of kind of some of the, the recipes. So I thought if you, if you want to walk us through some of the um, images yeah. in, in the book, that'd be great. Do we have some of the great. images? I think we have some of them. Yeah, but they'll come up in a second. They'll come up in a second. But yeah, the, 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 the images were shot by two friends of mine, uh, and, uh, Anita and, and Zania. And like, I suppose we also had a difficult job as well as I mean, fight on because the difficult job was how do you show people Ireland and Irish food, and also, A, you've got to make it relatable, and B, you've got to teach them something new. Like, there are two contradictory things. So I couldn't put a motorway through this, and then people are going, you ruined the image. And you go, well, there are motorways in Ireland, you know. Um, and, but we don't associate these things. So it, it's a careful balance. And of course, a book is always a constructed, uh, constructed uh, thing. But we did, do, we did do trips, and this was in the on the way out to the burn, yeah, this is uh, on, on the uh, corkscrew hill where there's loads and loads of hazelnuts. And so we did a couple of different, um, we went out a couple of times. And it was important for me to try and represent the, the natural beauty of Ireland, which is still something that we, 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 we I suppose something we forget about when our, as Ireland becomes more and more urbanized, uh, we forget about the, the, the beauty that is on our, on our, on our doorstep. And we, um, we take it for granted. And I remember, particularly for the chefs that come to Food in the Edge, and we bring like 50 chefs a year, and they're from all over the place, and they're famous and all that, and all that crack. And um, they, um, they I remember one of them, well, actually one of the guys from, um, uh, one of the American chefs was saying, God, we just don't, we don't have roads like you have. And really what he was saying was the country road that's full of gravel with a chicken running across it. Because we were out in that, and Ryan, he goes, God, I'd love to have a road like that in America. Um, and and we, normally when we go down, we go, oh my God, the road is so bloody small. And you're like, we, we need a motorway. And, and, and we, we forget that, that the smallness of Ireland is probably its unique selling point. Uh, and representing that is, um, is uh, is uh, is uh, is important, but the like back to the back to the image. I don't know if there's any. Is there food images, or I don't know if there was. A, I thought there was a food image or two. Um, what like again? We all the images had to be shot from above, and they all had to be very clear and crystal uh, in terms of to to illustrate it. So uh, we 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 had about a ten or fifteen day process where we had to shoot ten or fifteen images a day, and so we hit we did something like nearly 300 dishes in, in the period. And it was just like, oh my God, I got so sick of making food and trying to feed it to people. Um, <laughs> and when the restaurant wasn't open, I mean, it's completely opposite. Like going, get, get the, ringing the staff, going, you know, tell the secretary to come in here, there's a leg of lamb to bring home. Um, and uh, at the same time, I wanted to give Irish food a kind of, uh, we wanted to bring a certain kind of um, purity and a kind of cleanness to it, because often, when you imagine pictures of it, it's always those old school pictures where it's kind of very crowded and you have the pint of Guinness and, uh, and it doesn't get a kind of seen in its own, in its own light. And I, I wanted, we wanted to make them, this is a clams, uh, clams and breadcrumbs. And it's like a really tradition, it's like a, a recipe, like I think from the 1950s or something like that. But again, it's, we wanted to give, give certain dishes that I think had, had been looked upon as kind of like second rate and when you photograph them, and, and I remember so, so many of them were like going, God, Jesus, that's really nice. So many times we cook something and go, 
Because that's not bad, that one. Um, because there was so many times I would, I never thought I would have cooked certain things like girl cake or some of the cake, some of the things I made, it, we made in the book. Because there had to be uh, like the, I suppose the the archetypal Irish food had to go in there as well. And some of the things I'd never would have thought myself um, cooking. And then you'd make and you taste and go, geez, that's not bad. And um, this is a, like a wild mushroom and um, buttermilk, uh, uh, buttermilk um, tart. Again, two very very Irish things. Uh, but again, something like the tart is uh, is um, is something that we all grew up with, with our mothers or grandmothers making making tarts and the pie. These two these two things, um, because I suppose people were a lot more self sufficient and um, and and and, um, and I suppose frugal then, and our ability to make things like that is is sadly less because a we don't have the time and b we don't know how. And even the last time there was a massive storm in Ireland. We ran out of bread, but we didn't run out of flour. Everyone was just like, oh my God, we ran out of bread. I was like, if you have flour, you know, you can make some. You're like, I don't know how to make it. Um, and I'd say the same might happen here. It was like all the eggs and the flour and the sugar was all left in the shop, and all the flour and the chocolate bars were gone. And they were like, there's nothing left. They gone, the whole shop is full of eggs and flour and sugar. Um, and that, ironically, the, um, I didn't mention that in the book, but the, the, the three previous storms to that storm had um, the first things to run out were flour, sugar, and eggs, and it's just it's interesting how how that had um, how that had changed. And the backdrops we used, everything was shot from the wall, of course. So we, the the backdrops we used again, I, I was kind of looking for that the colours that would reflect the the landscape of Irish food because that's always what we try and do in an ear. It's like we want people to come in and have a meal and then go. Do you know that reminds me of when I was out, this is a really simple dish. It's like crab claws with sea lettuce and samphire. It's like something we would serve in, in tartare, and it's, it's made up of this little bit of butter in there. Now, of course, by little bit is a lot. So um, <laughs> I have people telling me, stop saying a little bit, but it's just a turn of phrase, uh, just a little bit of butter. And um, well, crab claws are, are eaten all over Ireland. And um, I, I think a lot of times we just, we, 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 um, we don't think about them enough to, to, I suppose, to make a dish out of them. And we, we serve them with like uh, lemon or Mary Rose or all these things. And sometimes you just want to go beyond that and go, well, how would I make, how would I be, how would I make crab claws more reflective of the, the surrounding landscape? And it's not to say that the, the lemon is a bad thing, but I was talking to the boss, the guys up in the Boston radio today about the oysters as well. Sometimes I think it's like, it's kind of like the easy way out is to put the lemon or the Tabasco on them. And the more difficult way is to, like these oysters are coming out of the sea, and what's around them? And what could we put with them that would make them more reflective of that, as opposed to putting a lot of Tabasco on them and down in 12 of them and going, God, they're all right, I don't really like them. Um, and just to give them a little bit more, um, a little bit more time. But again, the, 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 the images were, were, were very important, and, and it was one of the reasons why we, um, uh, why when I put the, the proposal to fight on, for me, I know Fidon through a true art history. I've always known their books, and the very first art book I read was um, was uh, was a Fidon publication. So I've always loved their books. And when they got into food, I would I would collect all the different books from different chefs, and so they were the the, the first ones I thought of because I wanted I wanted to represent food, but I also wanted to to uh, like to represent it in words, but also to represent it visually. And I think the, the, the texture of the book and the texture on the outside and the images and the, the, the font and all these things um, play a part in how, pre how people appreciate the book. And I think that's coming from a, like a restaurateur's point of view, that like the, the service and all these elements are so important and often we don't think about them because we're so fixated about food. Even in Instagram, narrows everything down to the food. And of course, like I put my hand up, I am absolutely addicted to Instagram and I take things all, pictures all day and uh, I can't get to the, the real camera I have. Um, but at the same time, it does, it does filter out the, the massive work that goes into the, um, the background uh, of, of making a dish and, uh, and presenting it. And the ways in which we present things is um, uh, is just as important, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, this book is um, it's presented beautifully, and the experience is quite different than, say, reading an academic text or a novel. You know, there's almost no point in flipping backwards through either of those. But this book, that's the first thing I did actually, yes. right? I didn't start at the introduction. I started with the recipes, and then I came to realize that this was a different kind of cookbook through that. Um, I mean, how much work did it take for you to ensure that? kind of your vision of what Irish cuisine can be and how you're trying to represent it on the international stage 
was actually physically represented in this way in the text. Yeah, like it's hard because like again, you 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 have you have the you have the time limit and you have the space limit and you have um, a, a market that wants wants it to be a certain way. Um, so like of course, I think every book is a, is a compromise between the author and the, and the publisher. I mean, compromise is probably a bad word, but like the wrong word, because it, it doesn't signify the, the, the kind of dialogue, you know, that goes between it. And often that's forgotten. And I think that was one of the most important things that I learned while writing the book. Because we did a, we did a, a, a cookbook for our tapas bar, we self-published. And um, we, you, when you have complete editorial control, it's a very, very different book. But at the same time, it, there maybe doesn't have that objective quality that someone else looks at and goes, you know what, maybe you don't need this recipe and that recipe, or maybe you could shorten that, or maybe you should lengthen that. And I do think that um, the, the editorial process is, uh, was just as vital in relation to shaping the book, because really what we had was we had 900 recipes. We had, um, a f we had different sections. I think cause, um, I, had, I definitely had mushrooms as a separate section. I think I had potatoes as a separate section. And there was mo many more. I think there was like 37 sections. And they were kind of narrowed down and uh, stuff was folded into, into each other. And so I think that was important into trying to get the, um, um, the book to be concise and to be more readable. Because I suppose it is, it is a book to read as, as much as it is a book to, uh, to, um, to, to cook from. Um, and like, I, think, like, I think for me it's, it's, a, great, um, it's a great beginning towards ste the, step f the steps forward that Irish food is going to take. I, I think I would just see it as, the, as, as a, I don't think it's fair to say it as the zero point because everything that, that went pa in the, before me is important. But at the same time, I think so many Irish food cookbooks have been directed inwards at ourselves. And, and we have, we've just been in dialogue with ourselves about Irish food. And occasionally, the odd one went out to an international audience. But for me, the, di the, this, the, the difference is this one, being published by Fidon is that Fidon an international publisher. And so now I think we can get a clearer picture of, hopefully, of, of how people will feel about Irish food and their understanding. And the books that will come after this one and we'll hopefully uh, learn like from this. Because at the end of the day, we only had 500 pages. And while that might seem like an awful lot, um, when you broke it all down and you, we got to the, say the oyster section, we could have two or three oyster recipes. And I think I had 25. And so we had to pick which ones. And the same way when it came to the vegetable section, it was like which vegetable recipes will, will, um, uh, will cover a certain technique or will they cover a certain product? And it was, it, that, that was difficult because I suppose there were ones that I would have wanted to keep that didn't make the cut. And at the same time, there were ones that I, that I said that had to be in the book that I'm sure if I would have said like, well, maybe like the birch wine recipe, which I was just adamant that this, but this recipe was in the book. And it's like a 17th, 18th century wine that I'm sure no one is going to make. Um, and you have to tap a tree. You have to go out into the wood, tap the tree, Get the birch, uh, bottle, make it, reduce it down, make your wine, and but we 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 tap trees in uh, in an ear and we get birch syrup. The same way you tap a maple tree and take a maple water, you reduce it down to a syrup, and we would use this birch syrup in desserts and that. And so for me, it was just the recipe was important to point towards what we do now, as opposed to what if, if anyone's ever going to go pop out and make themselves a bit of birch birch wine, because I'm sure it's just easy to go buy a bottle of white wine in the off-license. Um, but you know, someone may. Um, but at the same time, I mean, uh, I was, I was possibly a bit too artistic about some recipes. And um, I think finally we're a little bit more pragmatic and saying, look, you don't need 25 oyster recipes. And after I calmed down saying, I do, I do, I do, I go, do you know what? You're right. Um, and it was always that way, me having a little Mickey fit. And then they go, look, you would come back in a second. And I go, ah, you're right. About those things. And, well, it gives us an opportunity to get to your restaurant try the other 23, the other 23 uh, yeah. recipes. We have about a half an hour for questions yeah. from the audience. Um, there are two microphone stands, so I would ask you, if you do have a question, please go to the microphone stand. I'll also ask, if you have a question, uh, please keep it short so we can allow other people behind us um, to, to ask questions. So um, we have a question over here on this side. We'll start here. Hi. Uh, is that, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay. yeah. Um, Three words, fruits, nuts, um, fungi, what do you think? Are they critical to whatever you choose to define Irish cuisine as today? 
Yeah, I, I think they're very important. And I think when, when we think about Irish food, we, we generally don't think about fruit or nuts and also about, about mushrooms. And mushrooms is a good case in point that we, our, our tradition of eating mushrooms in Ireland is, is quite poor. And I don't know if that's reflective of our ability to get to the land or knowledge we, 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 we lost. Because it's not that we never ate mushrooms in Ireland. Um, it's just that we stopped eating them in, in the modern period. And we, and we, it was, we one or two. And it's interesting in, in, since uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. And I think very much since like the EU opened up, and we had so many Polish people coming to Ireland. They have a massive tradition of mushrooms, mushroom foraging from seps to um, uh, to morels, and even 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 just as big as the Italians. I think just the Italians like shout about it more, so they they seem to be bigger. Um, but the and they were always like saying like, why don't you eat these mushrooms? Like why like they're like they're there and they're free and well I mean free they're not they're free when they sell them to the restaurant they're twenty five euro a kilo they're not free anymore. Um, but um, so for me I was very interested in that and I see them again. Uh, those three elements, the, the fruit, like you have like native fruit, like the, uh, the apple, and then you have um, uh, the fungi of so many mushrooms that, uh, that grow in Ireland. Um, and I think that they reflect the landscape just as much as, as the beef and the lamb and the pork that define us. I mean, possibly they're not as much in people's consciousness, but certainly I hope they will become, and I hope that the tradition of mushroom picking or that will develop, or, or will redevelop rather, because I, 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 know, I have friends whose mothers and grandmothers went out picking mushrooms, and it, again, it was seen as a, almost in a negative light, um, because they had to go out and pick their food. It's kind of ironic that if you, if, you, if you were too poor to buy your food in the supermarket, then you were seen in a negative light. And so it was kind of interesting that to, to uh, assert your, uh, your, I suppose, your standing, you had to go to the supermarket and buy the blackberries. Because if you were seen down the road picking the blackberries, you were like, Jesus, Mary lost. Mary's not doing too well for herself. She's out picking fruit. <laughs> and, and, and that's what happened. And uh, Sharon would say this to her. The last, she was the same age as myself, maybe a little older. She would say, the last thing you wanted to say in school was my mother's a forager. It's like, you might as well be a peasant. Um, and now it's like, it would be like, oh my God, your mother's a forager. Like now it's like, wow, she should be on Instagram and have a channel. <laughs> uh, so it's very, it's very different. Very good. It's, it's the Kennedy story is about using history and, and restoring the great aspects of culture in a visionary, innovative, exciting way. And, and I, I hear in your story just how you're doing that through activating people to come eat in your restaurants, to read books, to join your teams. And I'm, I'm curious if you, if you could share a little bit about either the business or the, or the work to move from Rice Krispies and 7-Ups and, and, and the academic PhD to such a generative, cultural, multimodal life that you've created. What are, what are the principles that that help you that help you achieve that that's a that's a good that's a good question um, uh, I think like I blame my parents um, I think I blame my mother because she's too generous I blame my father because he's an academic and I think when those two things combine most academics sometimes are not as generous as they probably should be and uh, most generous people like my mother is the most unacademic person you can meet and so when these two things combine I think you get a willingness to try and develop and research, but then also to try and give it back. And that was the one aspect of, of the wild food section. It was like, why do people do things and then hide them and go, well, you're not getting that because that's our stuff. And I, I was the opposite. I was like, God, it's, it's really important that, that people do this stuff that we've been doing with, with wild food. And, uh, because otherwise, it will not become canonical. And it will not become an aspect of Irish food if you don't disseminate uh, this, uh, this information. And, but I, I think to answer your question, um, um, I think it's, it comes down to being confused. <laughs> um, and um, sometimes I wish I was one dimensional because I probably had an easier life. I don't mean one dimensional in a bad way. I mean one dimensional in just being happy doing one thing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm like I, my own worst enemy to, to, to do things and to, to um, want to try and um, uh, be in as many fields as possible. And that's not often a good thing. It's probably why I didn't finish 
the first PhD because often in the, in the academic world, you, you need to define your field and you need to be in that field. And sometimes the academic world doesn't like that. It doesn't want you to be in two fields at the same time. And, and maybe that's why this, this book sits between or sits across um, or among fields. As a, you can't be between three fields. You can only be between two things. Uh, but in Ireland, you can be between ten things. Uh, but I, I saw I stand I correct. I just remember that one of the corrections in my in my PhD. Um, I was like, I think you mean among, and I was like, no, I mean between. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's just a willingness to to investigate. And I don't. I think I've only reconciled that that um, aspect of being between places in the last couple of years because before I, I I never really felt in the to be wholly in the chef world and I never really felt wholly to be in the academic world I felt like almost like when someone has imposter syndrome I feel like when I was in one area I feel like oh god I'm not really good enough to be in this area um, and then I think what you realize is that everyone is is in many different areas and uh, always and it's just the the ways in which we 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 box them off and and I, I suppose I hope that by being in, in different areas and not being boxed off as much, that um, that other people will feel kind of like, do you know what? I can, I can if, I, if I want to be uh, an academic and an egg producer, I can be that. But I, I suppose I think for me, I just felt that I couldn't be that uh, 15 or 20 years ago. So um, I come from a family that identifies a lot with its Irish ancestry, although that ancestry is long ago came to the United States. Um, so we don't have a familiarity with Irish cooking, and my curiosity is, what are your conversations like with people like me, or people who have, you know, emigrated from Ireland, live in all across the world, places like here in Boston, um, who maybe are hearing about Irish food from someone for the first time? Uh, I, uh, that's a conversation my, my taxi driver tried to engage with me, and I was like, I don't have enough time. He just, he was pulling in, he went, so what do you think, what is Irish food anyway? And I was like, I, said, uh, I, I, I think two things. I think one, uh, I, I certainly would talk about the products that we have, the products that we produce. And these, these would go down to, if I had to explain uh, Irish food to someone like, we would talk about smoked salmon, we'd talk about black pudding, we'd talk about farmhouse cheese. Um, th that would be my first port of call. Uh, secondly, then I would talk about maybe what we do in the restaurant in an ear. Um, as uh, the, the project that we do there. And then the third aspect, which is, which is very, very important as well, I would talk about the ways in which food is, is cooked in very different ways in Ireland. And, and, and this is an important aspect, particularly in relates to migration, because often when we speak about migration, it's often something that, uh, that, it, that interferes with the national narrative. And we say that these people are not from here. And I would say, well, when you go back far enough, nobody was in Ireland, so everyone is always from somewhere else. Um, and I think that when, if, you, if you need to understand food in Ireland, you need to think about it in an expanded way. And I think that, and even so you, some people would disagree with me, but my Japanese friend Miyazaki has a, has a, um, a Michelin star Japanese restaurant in, in Cork, and he serves everything, he uses Irish produce. And it's, it's, he, he translates what he has known from Japan he, he, with Irish food into something new. And that, for me, that's very different from saying he's cooking Japanese food. He's not. He's using Irish products. And we think we need to understand that immigrant experience as well as the terroir-driven um, uh, experience and the, and the traditional. So it's, it's multifaceted. Um, and I would never like um, kind of uh, completely like just sidestep the, the traditional because it's probably your first port of call because the, the product in that is key. And so whether it's lamb stew or, or beef and Guinness, um, and then it, it's, it's about folding new, new ideas into that and saying, well, do you know we cook pigeon? And there's a wonderful pigeon and stout recipe in the book that, like, that, I, that, that it's a very old recipe and I just adapted it because um, uh, I think it's like an 18th century one and it was literally boil it, boil it. Uh, and that's the way I grew up with my grandparents. It was like, boil it. It was like, how long do you boil it for? A long time. <laughs> and uh, I was like, I better adapt that recipe because I cook things lightly. I mean, most people think I think I, I, I serve everything raw and it's like I serve it to like, it's like, near, it's, like it's medium. And they go, geez, that's very raw. Um, and um, the, we, I certainly, the, the, that experience is, um, is, uh, is something, again, that we, that boiling is, is again, this is fear of the ingredient and the, of the ingredient killing you. Um, 
Um, but I do think there's those aspects of the historical ones that, that, can, that can teach us so much about, um, about, um, about how we think about Irish food now. So, uh, my question is regarding the origin and the importance of it in cuisine. Do you find it hard dealing with local regulators as far as bringing in those products, um, seaweeds and wild you know, foraging? Yeah. We seem to be in an in-between space where it's, it's still, to a certain degree, in no man's land. Um, uh, and it's um, like there are not enough restaurants engaging with foragers for the, the health system to put some sort of gigantic thing in place. And so they leave it up to us to, um, to kind of self-regulate, because there's, there's only a few restaurants. Um, that would that would do it, and we have to. I suppose the the onus is on us to uh, to um, to make sure that everything is okay. As well, we treat our uh, the foragers or, or ourselves as just another supplier, and they they give us food, and uh, and then uh, and then we sell it. But I know there is there is a pushback, and certainly it's it's a, it's from a position of fear um, with um, I suppose with the regulators of, of, of food, and it is because it's something that, that is more difficult to define. And I think it's always from that position of fear that we, uh, that we have to um, try and um, create some sort of dialogue. My, my, in my experience, I always find the best way to do it is like, this is what we're doing. Um, I know that it's safe, and I can document that it's safe. Now it's up to you to, to uh, to come the 50% of the way. And often that's not the case. And I know it's the case all over the world because I have friends who engage with wild food and fermentation and all these places. And so for me, it's very, very important that we have to take these things out of the dark because often, often it's where, it's where, it, um, it's where it, um, it is. And, it, and that's, only, that's also in relation to wild game. I mean, they, they don't want you bringing in wild game because they want you working from um, a, a person that has been vetted. But that interferes with someone who is culling something that has an animal that needs to get rid of that animal because it's a dead animal and it's going to perish in terms of like it's, uh, it's already dead, it's, going to, uh, uh, it's, it's perishable, and it needs to be used. And so there needs to be a system that allows for that. And it's still, it's still not there yet. And it's still, a lot of times, we will get a venison and just go, yeah, it's from, it's from one of our, one of our um, uh, suppliers, but it's not. It's from one of the guys who shot it. Or, or a fish, one of the our fishermen uh, would drop in some, some trout. And it is difficult to do that in, in a larger establishment. And it gets much more difficult for a hotel to accept fish from some random fisherman uh, because they're more regulated and they have to go through all the administration than for me, who's the owner operator who go, of course, and uh, that's what we did on Monday. Some guy dropped in four fish and he said he caught them in the car and I said, great, I'll use them. And they were lovely trout and we cured them. And like, I think that relationship is very important. Um, I know it needs to be regulated to some degree, but you don't want to over-regulate it in the sense that that makes it disappear completely. And we have that issue with raw milk at the moment. and. Uh, um, it's uh, it, it's it's unfortunate that it's it probably it'll probably end the distribution of it as opposed to it should be protected as uh, as a as a um, I suppose a, as a, a something of heritage. But we still don't see food in that way as part of heritage and culture and art. We're always trying to protect art and culture and heritage. And when it comes to food, we think okay, it's important to overregulate it because we have to need to keep everyone safe. But sometimes you can you can you can do the opposite. Great. Thank you, Nicole. It's beautiful. Um, my daughter will be sending um, a semester in uh, the Water Grid Institute. Cool. Um, what would we or she should be expecting for dishes and things from that area? God, uh, like there is, it's a great institute, and I, um, I, I certainly would uh, would would recommend her to uh, to to have a look at probably some of the places that are. Um, of what they're serving down there and around Dungarvan, but even in, in, in Cork and, uh, and Kilkenny, they, like, there's so much um, uh, kind of vibrant food um, down there. Um, and I think, you, 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 again, you'll get a mix of like the likes of, say, Campania in Kilkenny or a French restaurant using the Mission Star restaurant using Irish products. And then uh, Paul Flynn's in Dungarvan, just outside Waterford, 
uh, like a brasserie, but again, also doing kind of contemporary Irish food, and you'll get all the stuff like champ and uh, all of the things that are the traditional stuff I mentioned. So you'll get a, she'll get a wonderful mix, but I would certainly, um, um, uh, hopefully she'll come back with a, a broader view and a greater understanding of, um, of Irish food, and hopefully she'll be able to pass it on to way more people than I can. Thank you. Hi. Hey. I was raised by these two people, superb cooks from Dublin originally. So when I think Irish food, I always think fish and apples. But there's a big question, and I can never get the proper answer to it. You started your comments about flour. It's clear, like when you're doing recipes, if we flour is different here. Yes. We can never seem to get the right flour to match up with the recipe. Can you talk about? What is that? Like, what is wrong or different, and how do we overcome it? Um, I suppose I, I just know from my own experience. Like, I remember when I made bread in Toronto the last time, I made soda bread, and it was completely, completely different. And I think it's, I think it's down to the, um, to the protein content in the flour. Um, now, I could be wrong, but um, I think when we, when we use flour in Ireland, we use like a strong white flour, or we use a wholemeal flour. But I think that it's the um, it's also the gluten content of the flour um, seems to be uh, greater in, in, in Europe than it is in here. But I don't know why that's the case. Um, and the, God, it's, uh, I think you could write, you could write another book on, on why the flour, why, why bread recipes don't work. They work in Europe, don't work in the States. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, but uh, there is a beauty in that, in the sense that, I mean, and I say it in, in the, in somewhere in the, in the book, is that like a recipe book is is a, is a um, uh, like a like a map to to put over a territory, and you don't if you don't have those the, the ingredients or you need to use different ingredients that is not to say you, that you can't use the recipe book because I would hate the book to be like that and I, I remember we were talking uh, when we were talking to the 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 editor and. I think it was, it was uh, talking to Lucy going like about seaweed because I had so much seaweed in it and they were like, you know, I need to rain in on the seaweed because it's hard to get. And I was like, ah, it's grand, that'll be fine. And, um, but I, 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 I thought it was important to say, look, if you don't have seaweed, like, don't worry about it, don't fret. If there's seaweed in the recipe and you don't find it, like if, you don't, if it's fresh, then get some dried stuff, which you can get in Whole Foods. If you can't get dried stuff, just leave it out or put something else in. And I think that, they're like recipes translate wherever you cook them. Like conditions are different in, in everyone's kitchen. And, and, and I, I do cooking classes all the time. And one good example is that we have this, um, we do a fish class and there's a fish stew recipe. And it says like eight mussels. And uh, this was only recently and the student got eight mussels. And I looked at them, they were tiny mussels. And I said, we should put in 16. And they were like, well, why say eight? And I said, well, the last time I wrote the, re when I wrote the recipe, the mussels were bigger. And, and so to a certain degree, you've got to bring yourself to the recipe book and, and trust yourself a little more. And as you're making a recipe, go, do you know what? It says 200 mils, but I think it needs 300 mils of water because maybe your cooker is, is different and it has evaporated slightly different. I, I know myself, every, every time I go to cook somewhere, like the first thing I've got to check is the oven and the, and the heat coming from the hob because they're the two things that are always different. And it drives me cracked. And I know when I go into an ear, I know the way, it's almost like, you're, like the, the oven's like your brother. Like you know what he's gonna do to you and you know what he's gonna respond to. And, and yet when you go somewhere else, it's like just, you're just talking to a stranger and you're going, why are you doing this to me? Like I thought you were friends. I thought, I thought 180 degrees Celsius was 180 degrees Celsius, not 200. I mean, whoever puts a probe into their oven and checks what the temperature is inside it, and we did this in an ear and it realized the temperature was like 15 degrees off. But I got so used to just being 15 degrees off that I didn't, I never thought about it. And it is, cooking is a very elemental thing and it's very personable. And for me, the, the book is just a guidebook to, to have fun and explore Irish ingredients and to think about Irish food rather than to be really prescriptive and say, did I make it the right way? And does it look like the picture? Uh, it doesn't need to look like the picture. So I think what you say right now brings up um, a question to me about authenticity of culture, right? So I would say if I was cooking an Indian, an Indian recipe, I would want to be authentic with it. I would want to represent my culture to people in a certain way. And given that there are these ingredients which are used the world over, but in so many different ways, right? Potatoes in Ireland are 
a thing, <laughs> and they are cooked very differently from the way potatoes in India are cooked, for example. Um, but when you are pulling together recipes and um, thinking about how they're going to be relatable to people, how do you, um, are you ever tempted to kind of step outside the, this isn't quite Irish, and bring in something that might add a twist or um, change things up a little bit? Like. I suppose yes and no. I suppose I, I was trying, the, the, the parameters of the cookbook were, were def, for me, were definitive in the sense that it had to have some sort of relationship to Ireland. Yeah, but at the same time, I do think authenticity is a red herring. And I probably, in my heart of hearts, don't believe in authenticity. And maybe that's the academic in me. Like, authenticity was beaten out of me. Like, I, I believe in, in culture, and cultures are different. And what, but I also understand the value of authenticity. And I think it is, it is important to think about some things as, as, as authentic, even though they mightn't be like a, 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 a timeless or something. That I do think it's, yes, it is important to think about lamb stew. And I think it is, it is, a, it is a recipe that is associated with Ireland. Is it an authentic Irish recipe? Like that, that depends on the person making it. I, I, I was interested in, in putting in stuff that would upset the narrative that people understood um, and uh, while I did want to get the puffin in to upset them, uh, the, 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 the narrative of upsetting was, I, like, and curry is a good example because you mentioned India. Like, curry has been in Ireland since the 18th century because soldiers fought with the British in India and brought back curry. And like, so that's not a known thing. And so when you put a potato curry in an Irish food cookbook, people are going, what are you talking about? Like, that's, just, that's not right. And it's not, and I think it is right because someone made it in Mayo or whatever when they came back and they had their little pack of spices. And seemingly this was quite typical for soldiers to get paid in, in spices and, and to bring that back. And only recently when I was, I was doing a bit of research on, a, I, I'm, doing, I'm doing a fish one at the moment, and I came across a lobster curry recipe from 1820 in Galway. And like for me, that's fascinating. That is not something that we would associate those things. But when someone looks at it, they would say, that's not Irish, you, you, that you've mixed that up a bit. And like, I would always look for some sort of historical record or some sort of um, connection. Um, but even, even, even yesterday, I was, I was on uh, Amazon just looking at the book, and someone had reviewed it. And they were saying, like, it has all the traditional recipes, but some of these recipes have a spurious relationship with Ireland. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that what he means by that, because I would love to have a dialogue with this chap, and say, like, <laughs> why do you think some of them are not Irish? And it's because we, we have the blinkers on and we have like, this is Irish. And at the same time, the Irish are, are, are bloody everywhere. You know, this is like the massive diaspora. And like we can, they're, they're, uh, we can connect and tread through so many different influences um, now. And even ones I couldn't get in the book, which would be like take on more contemporary influence from say the Polish in Ireland. Or, like there's, there's so many different ones. And um, I think, uh, like I've never been a fan of fusion. Um, of putting stuff together just for taste's sake. Uh, but I am a fan of, 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 of things that are together uh, historically, uh, historically, for historical sake, or things that, that work together that, because they grow together. And so that's, that's, I suppose, the way, the way, uh, the way I come, uh, the, the way I come at it. And so hopefully that answers your question to a certain degree. It's, it's, it's a really interesting question and, and to topic because the idea of what is Irish and what Ireland is is so strong in places like the United States yeah. or Australia and Canada to challenge that. It is itself a really an interesting task and um, process. And I, I would actually say, like I was thinking about this, and of course it's not entirely true, but it, like it's, it's, it's a good thing to say. I would almost uh, like argue, you could argue that um, the... the uh, that Irishness was invented in, in the States. And you could argue that, the, that, uh, that, that people in Boston and New York invented this sense of Irishness that we, in turn, um, became to embody. And this is over the 20th century. And you, you, I'm absolutely sure you could investigate this. And I think of it in like, it, when, when we, a good metaphor is how, how we understand Irish music, okay? Now we think Irish music comes from Ireland. And of course it does to a certain degree. But our understanding of modern Irish music comes from you guys. Because the Irish Americans wrote down what they remembered or what they interpreted. And of course this uh, 
policeman in Chicago was probably the most famous one who wrote down all the songs. They went back to Ireland as written tablature and then they were played and then they became Irish and then they went back to Chicago as, as something that was authentic. But they had come from Chicago in the first place because the Irish had an oral musical culture and stuff wasn't written down. And so you have a very complex relationship and I do think that happens with food as well. With then you have Irish immigrants coming to New York or Boston and saying, do you know what I miss most? I miss lamb stew. And they come back and go, oh, there's the lamb stew. And then all of a sudden, we're going, well, lamb stew is our dish. And then it gets forgotten in history because like over a 150 year period, a lot can be forgotten and a lot can be created. And like for me, I think it's really interesting. It's nothing to be, to kind of give out about when someone says like, well, corned beef, uh, corn beef and cabbage is not an Irish thing, it's an American thing. And that is true, it's like bacon and cabbage, and I think the corned beef thing comes from possibly the interaction with the Jewish community in, in New York and bacon and, and pork products and that being changed because of, of a cultural transformation. And then it going back to Ireland and then, and then people eating it in Ireland and then say, and us having to deal with that relationship. So like it's, it's so, um, uh, I think it's so interesting for me and it's the way food just travels and you can't pin it down. And, and that's, that, like, that's the beauty of it. Volume two will be the Irish cookbook in America. In America, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Last question. Um, I'm curious to know what your favorite Irish ingredient is and how you like to use it. Um, I'd, probably, I'd probably say seaweed, if that was with my Irish food cap on. You know, but that, saying that, like, my, like, I am not like this like, Puritan lunatic with like sea waving seaweed around that I always wanted to lash you with seaweed. Like my like my favorite thing to eat is like spaghetti bolognese, okay? And that is like that is the for me I had a, a food epiphany when I was eleven or twelve and I was in this hotel in Tipperary and we were there as a family, there was like six kids, it's the nineteen eighties, no one has any money. We're sitting down to have burgers and chips and I for some bizarre reason, don't ask me what, I said, I'm having spaghetti bolognese and my mum was like, You won't, you're not gonna eat it. And I was like, I am gonna eat it. And she said, Well go on then have it. And I just remember having this cultural epiphany about this dish, thinking, Oh my god, food is so much more than I think it is. Um, and see if it was a fancy place. I was like telling my, telling my father this and he was saying, Oh, they remember bringing you there. Um, and so it is like my, the things that I like to do personally are not necessarily the things I, I like, I like to, to champion. Not, not because I don't think the two things should coexist, but I think it's important to have, um, to have an understanding of both. And if, I have, if, if I'm in an ear and I'm cooking, I love, I love shellfish, I love oysters, uh, we have amazing sea urchins, I love using sea urchins and seaweed because what I'm trying to do is to define um, an experience for the people that come in. But often when I'm at home, I like, I, God, what, like, what's my favorite ingredient at home? Like, I mean, probably like, like I like, like cooking lamb, but I generally cook things quite whole. Like I cook a leg of lamb or a roast chicken or like very, very simple things. And I have two kids that ground me to say like, your cooking's awful. Like, and you go like, why don't you cook something normal for once? <laughs> and, uh, and so I've learned over the last 10 years, well, one's 11, the other's seven, that like fanciness does not cut it. And you make the chicken risotto and they go, that's disgusting. <laughs> and you go, okay, grand, mammy's out and we've made this and it's like, you're not gonna eat it, let's just do pasta and butter. And you know, I can make pasta and butter. I might use half a block of butter, but it'll still be fairly good pasta and butter. And, and so I think for me, the most important ingredient is, um, uh, is, the, is, the, is the act of eating. That's the most important ingredient. And I think it doesn't really matter what you're cooking. Um, of course it matters if it's, if, if it's a good product. But I think eating as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a people or as a community or as a family or whatever it is, I think sitting around and eating is probably for me the most important thing. Because then you, that, that's what, that, what food is. And even to, 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 to celebrate food. And I think even to watch my my, my daughter is very funny because she doesn't like, she loves cooking but not necessarily like eating. So I bought her a little frying pan, she was cooking the salmon and she cooked it and went, now you're grand, I don't want it. Uh, I just wanted to see what it was like to cook it. Um, and, and that's important, that's an important aspect that we forget, that we, 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 I don't want to ram seaweed down my kid's throat and say, you have to come out, let's forage and we're going out foraging. And I do bring them out sometimes, they're like, what are you doing to us? Um, but I think it's just important to, to uh, to uh, sprinkle enough of the experience onto them that they, that they appreciate it without having to say, this is the main thing you should be doing with your life. And I think that's, for me, the, the, where the humor and the, the humility of Irish food, and I think that's important because humility is, is, is an important quality, I think, of the food that we do. And 
Like, the Italians aren't very humble. Uh, they're like, I am the best. Uh, whereas the Irish are like, well, I'm not really that great. Um, and uh, I'd rather be friends with the guy who says I'm not really that great, because then at least you know you're not going to be, uh, you, you're going to feel comfortable with them and that. But anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> JP, uh, JP, it's, it's, it's been, been, been a pleasure and honor. I had a lot of fun. I hope you had fun. I enjoyed reading the book. I hope everyone else has an opportunity to do the same. I want to thank uh, the Irish government's Immigrant Support Program for sponsoring, and of course our host, the JFK Library. It's been spectacular uh, to be back here and to connect you with the JFK tradition. Thank, thank you. you very much.